We're back. Well, the Guardians of the CLE podcast is not so much the team. Hi, guys. I'm Mel. That's James. And <laughs> What's up? Sadly, the Guardians were free falling quicker than Tom Petty the last few days, James. Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> that was very, very unexpected. Um, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, for what we we saw, some stuff that's that, that was totally out of character for this team, especially when you compare the team to last season. I think I kind of got caught up in like the hype with Lucas Giolito and kind of the excitement, like a guy who pitched with the White Sox coming back to the Central. Could he carry the team on his back to a division title? And I'm going to be honest, I knew he might have been a little cooked, but I didn't know he was like deep fried cooked. Like he was like that piece of toast that you leave in the toaster way too long and then it starts smoking. That's like what he looked like the other night. Um, I mean, just he just simply imploded. I mean, he pitched three innings, gave up nine runs on seven hits, three walks, somehow got three strikeouts. I mean, I personally wouldn't have had him face Royce Lewis just because, to me, Royce Lewis is that guy. Out of all the young studs this division has, he's the guy that's going to like just haunt us for probably a decade. Um, obviously he's hit two grand slams against us before this. I mean, Giolito clearly didn't have it, but you know, sadly the bullpen just wasn't prepared. So he had Tito had to have him eat it. And obviously we were all disappointed. I think most of us thought we'd have a little bit of hope more so than just two innings and not even really two innings. Cause they came out and were scoring right away and give the, give the twins credit. Unlike last year, they came ready to play this series. Um, they were a hundred percent ready to go. Their bats were on fire and nothing. Our guys really did was able to slow them down. Um, I give Giolito credit. He stood up and faced the media and I mean, he tried to make sense of it, but I, James, I just think it was one of those nights for him. Like guys have those nights where they just can't get a feel for it. It was almost like watching uh, Syndergaard try to pitch. And when I've watched, when I watch Noah pitch and then also Giolito, it's almost like they're aiming the ball. You know what I mean? It's like, please don't hit me. And they're just trying to get it in the zone, trying to throw strikes. You just don't see a lot of confidence behind what they're putting out there. I, it was so shocking, too, because if you remember, Giolito has a dynamite changeup. And I mean, he owned the Guardians with it quite a bit in his tenure with the White Sox. And his strikeouts were up a little bit with the Angels. So, But obviously that's what happens, right? When you can't command it and you're spiking all of them and you're not getting ahead in the count, he wasn't able to use that changeup as a chase pitch. I mean, he's getting behind everybody. But then the craziest part in the third inning, he was actually starting to get ahead of guys. I mean, there were a couple guys he had down 0-2 in the count and just let him right back in and ended up walking them. And obviously we know you cannot walk, load the bases in general, but you can't hurt yourself with walks against the Twins because we got schooled the last three days what it looks like to have a lineup with true pop, right? Like just bam, Royce Lewis comes up. It's what, 7 nothing or something before we even blinked. I think you said what, you... Log, got home, logged on to Twitter, checked the score, and bam. It's like yeah, insurmountable already. Yeah, it was, I couldn't believe it. I think six nothing real quick. And I, I couldn't believe it. And then it was, I once I got the nine nothing, I just, I can't. I just can't do this. Um, yeah. It's just been a difficult season. I know one thing Matt Underwood uh, talked about last night um, was the team, it's the only team in baseball that hasn't won five in a row, but they haven't lost yeah. five in a row. And it's felt like that all year. It's like, felt, yeah. When are we finally going to get hot? We kept waiting and waiting, and just it's absolutely not going to happen this year. We're, it a hundred percent felt like that. Like when, and we knew it. We've talked about it before. I think back when we were talking about it, I think it was four straight they weren't able to win. 
or something, but now it's five either way. And it really has felt like that. It's really just the definition of mediocrity, right? And we, we talked last week about all the reasons why and why things may have went the way that they did. But at the end of the day, you know, guys like Tanner Bybee, Gavin Williams came up and kind of carried your pitching staff with the injuries to Tristan and Shane Bieber and Cal Quantrill between ineffectiveness and injury, Zach Plesak ineffective. And you were playing meaningful September baseball, even if it was only like September 3rd. It was meaningful baseball in September. I mean, Tanner Bybee had a dynamite rookie campaign. Um, and sadly, he just wasn't as sharp Tuesday. Um, it wasn't as ugly as Giolito. He did something Giolito couldn't do. He kind of was hanging by a fingernail on the tightrope, right? Like he was just grinding every pitch, every at bat. It just felt like he had to try so hard. Yeah. But he was actually in line for the win before Matt Moore's, one of the guardian angels, lone blemish, right? That solo homer to Vasquez. But, I mean, with Bybee not having his stuff, and we tried to avoid it, but we know he's hitting that rookie wall. He's pitching more innings than he has his whole career, and it's showing, right? Like, it's no it's no coincidence Gavin Williams was up to 99 today after he only pitched an inning last week. Like, these guys are tired, but they're grinding it out for you, and it's just a shame it's went this way. Like, you're in a do-or-die game, essentially, and you got Lucas Giolito pitching. who You just got off waivers. Two teams didn't even want him. And that's that's how this season's gone. I mean, Tanner Bybee's just – his starts have been unbelievable this year. And to, to ask him to carry this pitching staff, I don't think we've – I don't think it's really been where we've actually asked him to do it. He's just did it. Like, yeah. that's how he's been. Naturally. Built. That's what he does, and it, it's it's refreshing to see a rookie come up and be able to grind and, and be able to handle a season like he has and a lot of big starts. And, uh, you know, I'm just thankful that he came up when he did. Because where would we be without our rookie three? Yeah. You know, I mean. What about the emotion he showed, too? And, I mean, he was crying, and not in, like, a you're a baby type of way. Like, just pure passion. Like, he wants to win. He left it all out on the field, and, I mean, he did the best he could. It's, the offense couldn't do more against Sonny Gray. They had a lot of opportunities. But, again, story of the whole season, right? Just yeah. cannot come through with that big hit. And I'm sorry, but when you got Jose Ramirez the last 14 days and he's batting 200 with a 310 on base percentage, 460 slugging percentage, a 770 OPS and only six extra base hits and 50 at bats with only five RBIs. And especially with Josh Naylor out up until Monday, I mean, this team's just not good enough to overcome the injury to Naylor and then Jose go slumping at the worst possible time. And what's concerning to me is all the pop ups again, just like the second half last year when he had his broken thumb. I mean, it. it I, I was talking to somebody on Twitter about this, but James, you almost have to wonder if he injured something punching stupid ass Tim Anderson in the <laughs> face. Because he's, if you look like his hands coming off the bat again, like he was doing a lot last year, because I mean, it hurts. He's trying to play hurt. Or I hope that's it because the alternative is like, are we watching his downward trajectory already? How about just the pressure of being the star player on a struggling team? He's done that before, though. He, I mean, it, he looks so uncomfortable. If you think about it, like, his approach at the plate has not been typical Jose. He's chasing a ton. He's popping up I, an insane and ungodly amount. It just got me concerned a little bit. I mean... I just don't see Jose as a guy who's like forgets how to play baseball when the lights are bright. Yeah, but we're you know? not exactly protecting him in the order either. Right. You know I mean, it's not like Jimenez was having the season he had last year, and I know he wasn't batting right behind him, but there's nobody else that's just on fire that, you know, they can put behind him so he can get some better pitches. Yeah, we'll see if he can pick it up a little bit, at least end the year on a positive note. But 
before we just move on to the win today, I just want to touch on, I don't know, like, I felt like I needed to, like, rub my eyes, like, splash water on my face when it got to the eighth inning last night. Because I loved the fight in our team last night. I absolutely loved it. The Twins, obviously, they're a resilient team. They're a great offensive team, and that's they're going to keep punching back, right? You can't fall. You got to keep punching them back. And I think we did that last night overall. Like, I loved how we looked last night, but then the eighth inning happened. And, I mean, Trevor Steffen, for me, like, I've been done with him for a while now. He, I get relievers are volatile, but he's been really volatile. Like, he's been off more than he's been on this year. Um, and that's just kind of life with relievers. Sometimes they can fall off at yeah. any time. But James, I've never, I don't think, I know I'm only 32, but I don't think I've ever watched an inning unravel so quickly. It's like he had Polanco down 0 2, right? You're like, okay, he had just got the strikeout too. You think he's feeling good. And he's he's got Polanco down 0 2 and then just allows the sack fly. And, from the end, it put the twins up a run, just a run. You can come back from one run, but what happened after that? I feel like we need to put in the archives after this and never discuss ever again because he loads the bases, starts walking guys, he's getting booed, whatever. Then Donovan Solano comes up to the plate for the twins, kind of just bloops the ball into center. Miles Straw does everything he can to attempt to dive kind of dive for it, it just gets by him, and it just trickles all the way to the wall. And as he's chasing this ball down, I felt the the entire season from March 31st in Seattle, opening night, all the way to that moment, just all flash before me on the screen. Like, everything that can go wrong did go wrong this year. And it was all illustrated perfectly in that five seconds of Miles Straw chasing that ball to the wall. <laughs> so everything you're saying is just going to be how excited we're going to be for 20 for 24 <laughs> because everybody's going to have that bounce back year. Um, that's what we're hoping for anyways. But James, yeah, I'm not well, done with this year. You can I'm not hey, done. I'm not no, done. Listen, this- I am so toxic. Like, no. I'm telling you, listen, so. <laughs> you need to check out. Listen, hold on. First of all, like, I've been, people have been coming at me on Twitter and they're like, no, we need to lose games. We need Kyle Manzardo. We need George Valera. Let me make one thing clear. I don't care how much we suck. And I don't care how much they're pissing me off or how much we may be out of it. I am never going to root for this team to lose. To get a prospect up. I don't care about prospects anymore. Listen, I was telling someone the other night. We're like, we're young enough to be like, okay, maybe next year is the year. Maybe this next wave of prospects is going to be the ones to really take us over the top and get us that World Series. But like my dad was born in 1949 and he died in 2018. He did not get to see a World Series. He just missed the last one. And then sadly, he didn't get 2016. He he passes away in 2018. My mom's getting up there now, right? My mom doesn't have much more time left to wait on the guys raking in Lake County, right? So it's like when people are frustrated with losing, what do you expect? At some point, and I hope it's this offseason, but at some point you have to figure out what guys you want to keep, and what guys you're willing to move in order to improve in your areas of weakness. That has to happen this offseason because it's really, really hard to retool while contending, and you may never have a top five pick, and you may never be in for that decade-long rebuild, which I do appreciate. But I just think at some point, like, people are sick of losing, and I think that's acceptable. Like, there's people older than me who are a lot more pissed off than I am, and I'm okay, all right, like, we'll play this year out, let's shoot for 2024, and it just kind of is what it is to me. 
But I do understand the frustrations of people. That's my well, rant for the night. Yeah, but we, yes, we're struggling this year. But last year, we were fine. It was a totally different team. The way we were playing, our attitudes as fans, everything about it was different. So it's not like we're, it's back to back to back losing seasons right now. With all these prospects that you're saying that we have, the guys that are up, none of them have like played their way. Like Miles Straw, everybody wanted Miles Straw to the damn center field starting position, right? Who the hell came up and actually played him out of that position? Well, Brennan didn't do it. Oscar never took control over right field the, the, the few times that he's been up now. Okay. Jimenez didn't back up last season when he got his, you know, now that he's got his extension. You know, Jose is the only guy that's really put back to, and probably Classe, that's put together really solid back to back seasons. And I would, okay, let's, what, how, how do you feel about Quan? I think he's had a pretty decent year, right? I, I think he's the guy you resign. I don't think I think you keep one of them, one of Quan, Straw, and Brennan. Before Loriano, I would say pick between Straw and Brennan and make them your fourth outfielder. But you gotta like I don't understand why George Valera isn't up here. Because you need to see you need to get him some reps and see if he can be your right fielder. Because if he can't that's going to change a whole lot this offseason because I think when they moved Nolan Jones and they moved Will Benson last offseason, they put a lot of faith in George Valera. Obviously, he had the injuries, but he's on fire right now. And that's usually when they call guys up. But as far as, like, Quan Straw Brennan, I think Quan is great at what he does, but he should never be your best outfielder. If you're contending and you want to make a World Series push, I think he needs to be at least your second best outfielder. Yeah, Quan's, if that makes sense. Quan's your three on an outfield like what the Yankees always try to put out there. Yeah, absolutely. He's great in the leadoff spot. He's great at his particular role. And I'm never going to expect more than like 10 home runs out of him. So it's like if left field is kind of like, okay, you're not getting power there. Like we need to get more out of center and right is my yeah. take. But yeah, I don't we think. We need some home runs. But where are these guys that have been coming up? Why haven't anybody stepped up and say, that's my spot? Yeah. That's yeah. my spot. I'm going to play myself into it, and you aren't going to play me out of it. it. And it hasn't happened this year. And Brennan's been good, but he's still not providing you any power. He's a doubles guy, though. Even in AAA, he's a doubles guy, which, again, could be pretty valuable. More so in like a three to four times a week, I think. But I think they're relying on... Like, you knew Straw wasn't going to give you any power. Quan, I think I've seen kind of the increase in power at the level I needed to this year. I still think there's a little more in that bat. Um, but Straw's given you nothing. I think it should be a pretty sure thing. It's either him or Brennan that's going to be gone. And I know they signed Straw to the extension. But you need to open that center field up. Like, even think of a guy like Taylor Ward. For LA, he provides a lot of pop. And let's be honest, like the Guardians have all the resources in the world. They could go get Mike Trout if they wanted to. Like, whoever's available on the trade market, they should be players for if if they're an outfielder. Now's the time. Because Jose's not gonna just magically get even better. Like he's not going to go all the way back up. Like we've pretty much seen Jose's peak. You want to see him remain at that peak. But once you hit your age 30, 31 season, I mean, at any time he could start falling off a cliff and you don't want to keep wasting these prime years of your superstar. Like how many top five MVP finishes does this guy have to give you? Right? Like give this guy some help. Yeah, but you mentioned Mike Trout. I mean, if it's if it doesn't make sense to make that trade, I mean, you know, the prospects we're going to have to give up to get a Mike Trout who can't even stay healthy. And then you're going to yeah, take I'm on not... a big contract. So, I mean, I know it's kind of an example. Right, just like there, they could but, get anybody. But, like, you're, we're bringing these guys up, and if they're not taking off and they're not owning a spot and taking these spots and say that's my spot, we're also kind of killing trade value, aren't we? Like Will Brennan yeah. right now, Will Brennan yeah. makes he feels like a Tyler Naquin light, is what he feels mm. like. 
Like, where's the pop? Where's the right. home, home run? You expect come? more homers out of him. Yeah. Is, is it going to come with age? You know, as we talked about, so as players start getting a little bit older and into the, their mid to later 20s that, you know, they can start, uh, you know, adding to their power numbers. I, I, I just don't know if we can wait that long. Right. And I think it's a risk you take. Like, I think there's a lot of people out there because I feel like the fan base is kind of divided into like two segments. Like, one's all about the prospects and thinks you can just build a World Series team out of prospects. And the other side's like, that guy's hitting 206. He's not going to do anything for us. And I think there's a happy medium somewhere where I do think you could build a solid foundation out of our top prospects. But you and I have both kind of always agreed you need veteran leadership. You could have all the prospects in the world, but you need guys who have been there before. And I know Cole Calhoun, I get it. Like Lucas Giolito, even Noah Syndergaard, but like, I'm talking about veterans who have been there, who can actually like be a difference maker. Back it up like, with their play. Back it up with their play. Yeah. 100%. Like I think being great in the clubhouse, of course is valuable and you can't underestimate that. But it's like, you also want them to provide you something on the field that makes a difference in the box score. And I think that should be kind of their main focus this offseason. And it's interesting because Chris Antonetti kind of spoke with the media before the series finale today, which the Guardians won, by the way. Emmanuel Classe moved in for moved into a tie for fifth on the team's all-time saves list. So Congrats. He might even end up at number one when it's all said and done. He's still young. But he was asked about power. Like, what's been the issue with the power outage this year? Because we've all seen it. We've all talked about it. Pretty much the whole season, they've been at the bottom of the league in home runs and OPS and all slugging, all the numbers that equate to some sort of power. And these were his comments. Quote, the problem isn't power. The problem is we need to score more runs. Last year, without hitting for a ton of power, we did a good enough job scoring runs. We were more kind of middle of the pack. This year, we just haven't scored enough runs, and there are different ways to do that, power being one of them. What are your thoughts on those? Well, comments? that's true, but, I mean, we could also go back to when we lost our hitting coach. At the, in the off season, didn't he go to? I think he went to San Diego. Um, Our pitching coach? Or no, no. The I thought it was the hitting coach. Ruben Niebla, the pitching coach, went to San Diego last okay. year. But I thought we lost our hitting coach. We fired Ty Van Berkleyo after 2021. Yeah. Which that that was the worst Guardian season of the last decade, I think. So, so this year's not that bad, but yeah. So problem. And this almost reminded me of Tito's post-game comments in Houston where he's like, we didn't need a home run. We needed base runners. <laughs> and we're like, what? Just or hit both. the ball. We'll right, or both. both. <laughs> you could have base runners while they're rounding the bases on a home run. Like, why not just get it done quicker? But to an extent, I agree with him. Like, I don't think that you have to have a ton of power to be considered a good hitter. But you need to hit for some type of power. Like, you're not going to be last in the league in home runs and slugging and OPS all year long and expect to have a great offense. Because we saw it in October last year. When the pitching talent increases, say, in the postseason, it's a lot harder to string together three or four singles or even a double mixed in. It takes you a lot longer to score one run. So suddenly you're down three to nothing because another team hit a three run homer. And you're just like grinding and scraping, trying to get back into the game when sometimes you just need to hit a ball over the fence. Mm -hmm. And I know like Naylor does. I know Jose does. I know Jimenez is capable of it. But like we don't have a guy like Kyle Schwarber or anybody one through nine in the Braves lineup who you know anytime they step up, it could go over the fence. Yeah, and that I guy think, was supposed to be Josh Bell. It was, he, yeah. He went. He goes to Miami and starts hitting them. 
they'll never go for free agents again. It's going to be all trades from here on out, I bet you. It <laughs> never goes really well for them. And I, I'm not even mad at them for it because obviously they're going to try to get the bargains kind of once the big, big name guys sign, but it never works out for them. Like, I think most of us loved the Josh Bell signing. I know I did. I was never a fan of Zanino. And I gave Chuck and Quincy a whole bunch of crap on Twitter for it all off season. But I'll I'll die on this hill that I loved the Josh Bell signing. I thought it would be a tremendous fit in the middle of this lineup. And you know, tis is baseball. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. And I know we talk about expected stats, and they always showed that he was right there, that he was hitting the ball better than the box score was showing. But at some point, you got to get the results, and he just never got them here. And it sucks, but that you're right. Like they tried to address the power, they knew the offense was a problem last year. And I think between the regression of guys like Oscar Gonzalez, Andres Jimenez, Will Brennan, as we mentioned before. And then your free agents also not panning out. I think that was just the perfect recipe for an offense that just didn't do a whole lot. And we've said, we've heard this, you know, through our lifetime that it's just not our year. Yeah. It's, it really is never materialized for us. The twins are just a better team. And I yeah, think we, we just, and we've been we talking about the it. twins and, and look, Buxton's not even playing right now. You know what Who's I mean? That's that, that's another guy you would think that would be there. It's like, oh, we don't, you know, he's he's helping them get over the hump, but he's missing in action again. Yeah. And I mean, the first order of business this offseason is obviously going to be Tito, right? I mean, he pretty much all but announced it once again on Sirius XM MLB radio. He just kind of said that it was time. Um, he kind of informed the team that his body's telling him that it's time. And I think he's kind of given the organization like a heads up so they can at least prepare for the fact that they're going to have to go out and look for a man manager for the first time in 11 years. Um, I think the offseason obviously is going to start there. And Chris Antonetti was asked about that too today. And obviously he's not going to comment much on that besides what Tito had already uh, mentioned on his radio interview. Um, but, uh, you know, that's going to start after the season and it's going to be weird. I mean, because I think it's entirely possible because I know a lot of people were coming for me last night. Um, my Twitter handle is up on the screen. If you want to be one of those people at mellow underscore N I E 91. And anybody who follows me knows I've been tough on Tito this year. I've been tough on his in-game decision-making. I've been tough on his bullpen usage. I've been tough on his lineups. Just riding with guys for far too long. Um, the sporadic playing time for prospects. things A lot of things just don't make sense. Like, he left Trevor Stephan in entirely too long last night. And I think it was the first time most people on Twitter agreed on something. Like, we sacrificed Monday night. We made Lucas Giolito a sacrificial lamb. So we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to use a guy too long when you know knew you pretty much needed the next two. He left Trevor Stephan in too long. The bases clearing triple happens, and, you know, that's all she wrote. But I think it's also okay to acknowledge that while also acknowledging what a great career he's had overall. As he's gotten older, sure, he's a little bit stubborn. He hasn't really adjusted to the nuances of the game. We know he doesn't love analytics, all that stuff. But I think when you look at the course of his Guardians career, it's been fantastic. And, James, I don't think it's crazy to say the organization is in a much better place where he's leaving it than when he took it over. Well, and you got to remember, he chose us. Yep. Right? That was the other thing. He left Boston, won a couple World Series. He chose to come to Cleveland. His heart was still here from his dad being here. And I can tell you a story. From his playing days, which was not very many with, with the Indians, the one thing I can remember <laughs> about him, and this is, just sounds totally Tito, the one play I remember of him making, it was the first time I've ever seen in a major league game, is he was at bat and it was a catcher's interference and he got to take first base. That's the only highlight I remember of him actually playing. That's so Tito. Plays. Because I'm like, what's going on? I'd never even seen it before when I even played like Little League and stuff. I played catcher 
for for one year and i never had that happen and uh but yeah it's a total tito story to, that's his highlight of his career as an indian that i remember but uh yeah great manager um i i just think i'm i think it's good that he's looking to leave on his own um you know i hope for his health that he, that he does well and he's going to do okay i think he'll still still be around maybe floating around spring training at some point um just kind of roaming around talking with the guys maybe not this next next spring because he won't want to be a distraction from whoever the new manager is um but i think we all know that's gonna it's gonna happen so that last game in detroit was going to be miguel cabrera's last game and also it looks like tito's uh last game so that's going to be a heck of a ticket yeah heck of a ticket up there in detroit and the question was always could they make one final run for tito because we all know in comparison to last year, this year has stressed them out, right? It's been a lot different than last year. Things just have not fallen into place the way that they did last year. And I hate to be the hopeless optimist. It's not what I'm going for. But I think the next couple of weeks could, could still be fun, right? We got Bo Naylor's development. I mean, what a huge development for that Bo Naylor came up and he's been the bat we all thought he could be. When they whiffed on Sean Murphy in the offseason, I was terrified that Bo Naylor would not pan out. This organization had so much riding on Bo Naylor being their catcher for the next decade. So I can take a sigh of relief that he looks the part. He's been great behind the plate. He's only going to improve from here. And he hits bombs. And that's what this lineup needs. Um, but just just for shits and giggles, entertain me for a minute. Cleveland's remaining schedule. And remember, when we looked at the schedule at the All-Star break, this stretch looked a lot harder then than it does now, right? So they head out west for seven. They're at the Los Angeles Angels dumpster fire for four games. The one guy that didn't get claimed on waivers from that team was Randall Gritchick. They put him back on waivers. They are desperately trying to get rid of him. Um, so hopefully that all works out for Randall Gritchick. Then they go to San Francisco, Oracle Park, for three against the Giants. They are ice cold right now. They just got swept by the Cubs in Chicago. Then they get an off day. They come home for three versus Texas, who might be the only team in baseball free-falling even faster than the Guardians. That would be the Texas Rangers, who have just completely imploded and forgot how to hit a baseball. Um, then they have three at Kansas City, and they finish with a nine-game homestand, four versus Baltimore. Who, who knows? Maybe they have the division wrapped up by then. Maybe they're resting some guys. Two versus the Reds. They may be out of it by then. Three versus the Tigers, who are playing a lot better lately, I will say. Minnesota's remaining schedule is three versus the Mets, three versus the Rays, four at Chicago White Sox, three at the Reds, three at home versus the Angels, three versus Oakland, and three versus Colorado. So, they end their season with six against Oakland and Colorado, which is annoying, but what are you going to do? I think it could still be a fun last couple weeks. I know it's a Tito team. Tito teams don't mail it in until they're mathematically eliminated. I think the magic number is like 16 right now. So they did their part. They bridged the gap to the next sport, and that's what we do in Cleveland. We just continue to Bridge the gap till the next sports team comes on. We get our hopes up for that team. They don't look great. And then we're on to the next one. You know, your Browns background you have behind you. Browns come back Sunday. So, hey, the Guardians did their job. Yeah, and they've had great attendance this year. You know, they have, for, yeah. For not having and, the homers that all the, the 90s teams of the 90s that sold out 455 straight, not having all those home run teams. Uh, we've still turned out pretty well. So a lot of we the did. promotions that they've been doing uh, this season is, is between fireworks and bobbleheads and the and the bars and stuff that are inside now. Um, the the monthly pass, ballpark pass. So there's a lot of things that's uh, you know it's been good to be a to be a fan outside of the what's in the standings. So I would just my message is to just try to enjoy the rest of the season, enjoy we'll it for it what in it December. is. Yeah. You know, October will be here, even though the calendar just flipped. It's going to fly by. October's going to be here. We got the one game at Detroit, Cabrera's last game, and likely Tito's last game. 
and then it's all straight football. Yeah, and we're going to have uh, Tristan McKenzie and Shane Bieber throwing innings at Lake County tomorrow, facing live batters. Um, the team says they could be back at, around September 20th. The games may not matter much then, but who knows? What, what happens if Minnesota gets swept by the Mets? The Mets are playing better. The Mets aren't a total disaster anymore. Then suddenly we're three back. I don't know. I'm just trying to keep everybody hanging on just like just like I am because I'm a toxic Cleveland fan, and that's what I was raised to be. So we'll see next week. Tune on in tomorrow night at 930. The Guardians will be in Los Angeles taking on the Angels. Shohei Otani has an oblique injury, so I'm not sure if he'll be in the lineup for that. But just enjoy the next week of baseball, everybody. Try not to get too frustrated. And in the meantime, make sure you're following the podcast podcast page at Guardians OTCLE. And head on over to BelieveLandMediaLLC.com where you can catch all our podcasts and written content. We got you covered with all the professional sports, college sports, high school sports, everything. Go on over and check out the team, support the team. We appreciate all the support. Um, and then, James, you got anything you want to add? Yeah, like I said, just try to enjoy the rest of the season. You know, I know the standings are frustrating, but just be thankful we we have baseball. We could be like the Oakland A's where you, your team's going to be leaving. Um, be thankful for being a big league city and having a major league team uh, and a major league park. It's a beautiful park. So, Great message, and we will catch all you guys next week uh, for another episode of the Guardians of the CLE podcast. And in the meantime, everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, don't be a jerk, and go Guardians. Go Browns. Oh, yes. And go, go Browns. Browns, yeah. Take it on the Bengals. Go, go send the Bengals back to Kentucky. <laughs> Bye. See you.